From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It is time for our weekly listener mail segment. Uh, as we get started, uh, due to a, uh, <laughs> it turns out one of our listeners may indeed be a poltergeist infecting my computer. So we have someone along for the ride. This podcast may sound a little bit different, uh, but uh, these are simply the hazards of the pandemic. And as always, thank you for joining us. Fellow conspiracy realists, we have some doozies today. Our stories today are uh, taking us to the world of electronic snooping on your smartphone, uh, to a new kind of emergent running cheese theme we have on the show. And uh, they're also taking us to an experience with a cult-like or cultic group. So maybe we can uh, go in that order roughly. Uh, Matt, you found a pretty astonishing uh, voicemail from one of our fellow conspiracy realists. Well, uh, you know, I will preface it in this way. The voicemail itself is great, but it, there wasn't a lot of information in it. So it required a phone call. So uh, the reason why we're talking about it today is because there was so the story that I was told by this person was pretty astonishing, and I wanted to share it with everybody else. The first thing to note is that this caller had an experience that many people did when they listened to our initial episode where we talked about Mother God. And is it one love? I, I can't remember the name of the love has one love has one uh, when they heard that episode and the news immediately came out of the demise of Amy Carlson. So let's listen to this caller. Hi, I listened to your podcast for the first time in my entire life today about a uh, cult. And I was going to call you because I had some feedback uh, as a person who's been involved with some like that in the past. But also, fucking Amy Carlson was mummified with Christmas lights today, and I'm just kind of mind blown. So I figured I would share the mind blownness as a quarantined person with nobody better to talk to with y'all, and make sure that you guys were aware of this. Obviously, you don't have anything better to do than chat with you guys. But if you want to call me back, go for it. If not, that's fine, too. I'm definitely going to keep listening to your podcast. One love, two chains. Have a good night. What a great ending. Right. And a great alias. My goodness. Right. So that's what we were going to call this person. One love, two chains. It's a lot. So mentioning, we're just going to say two chains. I'm just going to say two chains every time I refer to this person. Um, but yes, thank you so much for calling in. And as I said, like not a lot of detail there about this cult experience or, you know, some similar experience that she went through. So I gave her a call and uh, we talked about some things and I'll just tell you what we discussed. So this person, two chains was living in the city of Denver, Colorado, and she had an experience with a group that didn't call itself a cult, as many, many, if not all cults do not refer to them as such. Um, it didn't it didn't have any name whatsoever. It was just a group of like minded people living together. This is how she got involved. And this is important. And it may resonate with some of you listening who've been through something similar or in a similar situation right now. She was working at a uh, dispensary for cannabis. She was a bud tender. And this guy just walked into the dispensary one day. She said he had very bright yellow eyes, um, like brown and yellow eyes. She said he looked into her soul and said, quote, you're sick. I can help you. And she felt in that moment like she was, you know, being chosen or called out. In retrospect, she feels like this was the initial part of her grooming or her initial, her, uh, eventual grooming with this group. And 
He said, I will give you all of this knowledge that like to fix you, to help you at no cost. I just want to help you. And it struck her as a fascinating interaction. She ended up calling this person. They went out to eat and he said, here's what's happening. Quote, your gut is full of all this bad stuff, not just what you're eating. Also your vibes. It's all manifesting in your body and it's making you sick. And if you trust me, I can make you better. Well, be careful with that line. It's an antique in the world of cults. <laughs> really? It is, right? <laughs> if you trust me or I will make you better. Which one? All of it? Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some flags in there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I am the only one who can help you. If you enter into a close trusting relationship with me, the use of the words manifesting the use of the word vibes. I love the word vibes, but I am also like all of us pretty conscious of the fact that it is not scientific terminology nor medical terminology. It is a great uh, 80s rom-com, uh, supernatural rom-com starring Jeff Goldblum and Cindy <laughs> Lauper. Thank you for bringing that up, Noel. Yep. It's, it's been a while since we mentioned that on the show, so I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful piece of cinema. Uh, for anybody who's a real uh, cinephile, uh, you should check out Vibes. Definitely. 10-10. 10 10 and only because we can, the scale only goes up to 10. That's right. That's right. And I'm assuming 2 Chains has also seen Vibes. Um, so no matter what you think or feel about this situation, this person and what they were saying resonated with our friend Two Chains, and she ended up dating this person. And it strikes her that, at least later, she didn't. She doesn't know how many people this person was dating at once. She, it felt like she was the only person dating him, but she's unsure. And especially after learning what she learned later down the road, she wonders uh, about that. So it gets weird immediately. This person, Yellow Eyes, made her stay at his house or this house where he was. He kept constant tabs on her, made sure she was eating only very specific things that were part of her treatment. Yeah, um, she says it was very spiritually based. the The concept that this group put out and um, this person put out was that uh, it's it's not like Amy Carlson's thing where it's I am the manifestation of God or I am God. It was more God is the universe and we can access God through specific substances, what we put into our body. And one of those substances, and this ended up being the key to their entire group, was ayahuasca. Now this oh, wow. is something yeah, something we talked about before on the show. Um just uh, Noel or Ben, can you give us just a quick rundown of what ayahuasca is? Yeah, sure. So ayahuasca is a psychoactive uh, substance. It's generally ingested as a tea in the Amazon region, uh, and it sends people on, you know, it sends people on spirit quests, right? Uh, there have been some deaths reported uh, due to ayahuasca consumption, but those are, are believed to be due to the, uh, the addition of other ingredients, you know, other hallucinogens maybe or contaminants uh, or issues with dosing. But this is a very old process. It's it's legit. Traditional healers in various countries in South America use this tea in a highly ritualized fashion. Like people aren't, ayahuasca is not a club drug. And I think, Matt, that ritualization is going to come into play here. Is that correct? That's exactly what was happening. This group was treating it as a very holy thing, the the quest to get the ayahuasca and then really what to do with your body prior to the ayahuasca ritual. So part of this whole diet thing that they were doing was all about preparing the body for that. So she said that the group, they put her and a lot of other people in the group on a very strict diet. So there's 10 days of eating nothing but apples. Then after that, three days of absolutely no food just consuming water, then 24 hours with zero water. And then the plan was to fly some person, a you know, they called this person a shaman, out from Ecuador to the United States, to Denver, Colorado, to provide the ayahuasca and to perform the ritual. And they said, once we've done this and it's completed, you will be cured. Of your bad this vibes. Is your, your bad vibes and all the other bad stuff that's inside you, right? You're literally ridding everything, including 
you know, through your mind and your spirit, you're removing all of this stuff. That's the concept. So she starts talking to her friends and family outside of this group about the group, and they didn't like what was going on. They didn't like the people. Um, to her, though, in this moment, this group was paying very specific attention to her, something that she felt perhaps was a bit lacking in her life overall, and it was making her feel better being around them. And it's tough because those people who were trying to raise flags for her in her life were then kind of removed from her life because the group was encouraging her not to hang out with anybody else who was not a part of the group. Something that we constantly, consistently see with cult-like groups. Then she says it got even weirder because the group actually got this person, this shaman from Ecuador, to fly out. They, they paid for him to get there. And then everyone in the group, their lives kind of shifted. Ooh. It became priority number one to sell jewelry that this person had brought over. Ah. Right? Okay. And they're they're making money in this way, but they also found out that this person didn't just bring specifically ayahuasca or the plants necessary for that. He also brought other things like Datura. And this is something that I was not familiar with, but this is a poisonous flower. Um, according to two chains, this flower is used by monks in, in some ritual where they appear to die, but then come back to life, uh, in a temporary fashion. I couldn't find much, uh, like written about that, but I know Datura, like ayahuasca has a rich history of being used in, uh, you know, as a poison, but also in rituals and spiritual rituals. It's also an anesthetic. In some cases, yes. you might notice it as Jimson weed, I think, yes. is one of the other names. Absolutely. It has lots of uses, but it it can definitely turn nefarious really quickly. We don't have to go through everything that Two Chains said here, but I just wanted there are a couple other things here that were very odd to me. One of them was that everyone in the group would be let into specific information that two chains considered to be in a legal gray area, if not a very illegal area where, you know, we're talking about selling jewelry here, we're talking about making money in different ways. One of the things that this group allegedly did and this uh, shaman did was that they would seek out children who had been featured in documentaries and this sounds weird, but specifically children's features in documentaries who had been uh, cured or, or healed in some way by cannabis. So they would tar they would find or like watch these documentaries, see these children, then target the adults in those children's lives to convince the adults that what these kids really need is their system, their diet, their ayahuasca ritual. And according to her, they would convince the parents to give their children ayahuasca and to put them through a ritual, which seems like something pretty heinous and not recommended, at mm -hmm. least to me. Um, but again, the whole point is that as you go deeper into the group and as they trusted you more, they would tell you about these other activities they were doing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an incremental indoctrination that's i I'm, i don't want to get too far ahead but i have a feeling matt this is going to be one of those uh things where we uh two chains at this point what we're saying is we can recognize some of the steps that are happening here uh, as a matter of fact when you when you get a chance if you're interested i uh, highly recommend our old video that still holds up could you start a cult yeah because yeah. when you look at these stories uh, we're not i I'm not saying at this point that the yellow-eyed man is definitely angling to be a cult leader, nor am I saying that this person was insincere in what they're saying. They may really believe this, uh, but they're checking a lot of boxes. There's a mm -hmm. finite number of boxes, and so far they're checking them off. I guess the next step would be, um, let me guess, not to make it too game showy, um, would the next step be further ritualization and isolation. Yes, exactly. Now all of a sudden, aloe has to be in all the food that she eats and the group eats because the rules just change, right? Then all of a sudden, it, it happened incrementally to her within this group, but all of a sudden, she had to wear specific clothing 
that the group would make whenever she was menstruating. And all of the women in the group, when they were in, in that cycle, would have to wear this specific clothing. And they, they explain, you know, in ancient times, women who were menstruating in their cycles would, uh, or in their moon time, I forget how, exactly how she phrased it, but the way that they would talk to her about it, uh, they would put these women in huts and they'd have to stay away from the rest of the group while they were doing that. Now you just have to wear this clothing and it's still, it protects us and you in the same way. Like magical thinking to a large extent and also, you know, ostracizing someone for going through a natural process. Uh, in hindsight, in, in our conversation, she thinks it may have had something to do with the leader of the group and the women, like knowing immediately visually which women were available yeah, sexually, to it. put it in a not light way. Um, but, you know, I can't confirm that. She can't confirm that. It just felt like perhaps it was a control mechanism. Um, then in, in the control mechanisms got worse. They had access to a laptop that was there at the place where they were staying that had her iMessages opened up. Like if you open, if you have your mm-hmm. messages app on an Apple computer open that's connected to your iPhone, that was always open and on like set up in on this laptop. So if she ever left the house and she was texting with anybody, people at the house could read those entire text chains and keep tabs on her. Erosion of privacy. Check. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's really messed up stuff. It, eventually, it got to the point where, you know, they did a ritual with the Datura, the poison, which was not a great experience. Then they told her she was going to have to drink her own urine for two weeks in a cleansing ritual mm. and that everybody was going to have to do it. And at that point, I think she had had enough of, you know, jumping through the hoops and believing in the thing and, and that it was good and just decided to leave. Thank goodness. Um, but then this whole other thing happened that after she left, the people in that group were reaching out to her clients and, you know, saying things about her that were untrue. The other thing is, by the way, I didn't even bring this up. The group leader guy did what a lot of these groups do where they become extremely intimate with you in conversation. They learn everything they can about you. And then they end up using that against you in some way, not open at all about themselves, but always asking you how you're doing, what's going on with you. What, you know, it's, it's a very, it's a tactic that occurs all the time. Love that's what, to leverage. That's what I call it. There you go. A lot of people use it uh, in these groups. So, um, Anyway, all of that's occurring. She ends up leaving. She finally gets away with them for a long enough time. Then she gets contacted by another young woman who's going through the exact same thing. Only this person has gotten to the point where, you know, the urine drinking is happening. Um, It was really, really bad. According to Two Chains, this person was committed uh, to a hospital for mental issues by the leader of this group. After she um, had had enough and wanted to get out, but couldn't. There, there are allegations here of being locked in a house, locked in a room, all kinds of bad stuff. Uh, we don't have full details about that, so who knows? That could just be a story, or it could be completely real. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this all of this is to say that Two Chains had a, an experience that she didn't understand in the moment, but in hindsight, she realized what it was. And her big, she had a bunch of red flags and takeaways. There are all kinds of things that we've discussed before in relation to cults on this show. So I don't, I don't want to go through all of that, but one of her big takeaways is that there's so many, there's so many groups out in Denver, in Colorado, in places in California that do this very similar thing. And they almost never present themselves as dangerous whatsoever in the beginning and until it's too late. And almost none of them have a name, like an official name, unless she said, and this is something I'd never known before, unless it is the name of a company, especially a company that would be considered by many people to be, um, it's not the right way to say it, but like a hippie industry or a counterculture, maybe counterculture industry. 
it reminds me of that story we did about that dude in New Mexico in Santa Fe that was sort of this like internet hippie self help guru kind of cult leader that you know it was mission creep right it started off as like this kind of like um, kumbaya kind of like like self actualization and I'm not mean to be dismissive of any of that stuff it works for lots of people and I think there's a lot of positivity in in these kinds of things but then it devolved or crept a little bit more into this worshipfulness of that one individual. I can't remember his name now, but we covered that a couple of times. Bentino Massaro, maybe. That's the guy. Yep. I still get his newsletters. One of the few bad Bens. (laughs) I say that with no small measure of regret. I mean, I I think the most important part of the story here, 2 chains, is that uh, you you made it out, and that is no Mm -hmm. small feat. So it's something to be very proud of and very thankful for um, and so glad that you saw the signs early enough uh, because these sorts of things can escalate. Again, you know, Matt, Noel, I think we can agree that we don't have conclusive enough information to say for sure this is a cultic movement, but this is certainly quacking like a duck, I would imagine. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to give you one last takeaway from her. She said, be very aware of any group that is welcoming and kind immediately, initially on the surface, but wants you to constantly prove that you're loyal to them and only them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, words of wisdom. This happens a lot, too. In you know, I've been, I, I've been talking about this or alluding to it in past episodes, but I, I didn't I'm closer and closer to just doing a mini series of something called, you know, like Hidden America or Invisible America or something like that about folks who live on the edges of what we would call mainstream. And if you go to a lot of festivals or if you go to things like regional burns, which are regional versions of Burning Man, uh, or if you go to rainbow gatherings, then you will run into organizations like this or you will run into people who want to create organizations like this, and they want folks to control. They want disciples. At this point, again, it's tough to say whether the yellow Hood men's motivations were sincere, but if you look at this, it's like a cognitive boa constrictor. You know, it's tightening its grip on people. And I'd be interested to see if the rules of the yellow Hood man applied to him as well, or if it was mm. L. Ron Hubbard style and it only applied to his followers. Yeah, I we don't have enough info right now, but um, maybe we can learn more in the future. If anyone's had interaction with that specific group, again, this was in Denver, Colorado. Who knows? Who knows? But thank you so much, Two Chains, for uh, for calling in. I really enjoyed talking with you. We will take a short break, and we will be right back with more messages from you. And we are back. We have returned. We have not returned alone. We're uh, we're we're gonna roll pretty heavy with uh, Ryan. Ryan, you wrote to us with a great story. It's one that we had. I don't think any of us had heard of yet. Uh, just a little setup uh, before we before we talk with Ryan here, guys. We've we've spoken in the past about the extent of corporate corruption, big agribusiness in the U.S. in particular, like, we can say it, the food pyramid is pretty much malarkey. It was it was made to sell stuff uh, more so than it was made to give growing people adequate nutrition. I mean, it'll, it won't kill you, but there's definitely a profit motive. And Ryan, you took this a step further when you said, my guys, I've heard a few stories about government cheese. We all know the official story. If not, I'll attach some links. I've heard rumors and stories that the cheese is still being distributed, that the cheese powder in our beloved mac and cheese is actually produced from the government cheeses of the 80s, 1980s, I assume, Ryan. The government has been so desperate to rid itself of this cheese that it incentivizes restaurants and companies to advertise cheese products to help get rid of this massive cheese surplus. If there are still cheese caves, are we entitled to a cheese stimulus? Oh, man, 
Ryan is on the you are on fire, dude. Uh, not sure if this counts as a conspiracy or not, but it would be cool to dig in. Think of the plethora of cheesy puns that could be mixed in during this discussion. Thanks, Ryan. And Ryan included a couple of helpful links here. Uh, I think we should just let the the big badger out of the bag right at the top. Ryan, you are correct. There is something very much like a conspiracy afoot. So here's here's the issue. The cheese consumption for the average American citizen has increased precipitously from the 70s to the current day. According to the USDA, uh, the average American eats around like 35 or so pounds of cheese, which sounds like a lot when you think of the lump sum. But, you know, if you shred that usage and you sprinkle it over the pizza of a year, then that's that that sounds reasonable. And think about the commercials we see. You know, sometimes they're called and I'm not the hugest fan of this term, but it is accurate. Sometimes food commercials are called food porn. And there are these slow motion, decadent scenes of like the Taco Bell quesadilla cracking and you see that gooey cheese stretching out, you know, like uh, like what are other commercials you guys have seen? You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, a mozzarella stick. I always think of a nice cheese pull on a mozzarella stick. Perfect. Yeah. The cheese pull. <laughs> that's the move. And, and of course, that's part of the business of uh, food photography. That That's. The reason the real cheese doesn't move like that is because what you're watching is not real cheese. It's very cleverly designed uh, substance. But turns out, Ryan, there is something called the Illuminati of cheese. No, and this, shut your mouth. I, I can't. I can't. Uh, <laughs> it's it's true. It's the it's something called Dairy Management Incorporated. So here's. Here's what happened. The government of the U.S., like many other world governments, uh, places a lot of emphasis on supporting its domestic agriculture. That includes livestock and dairy. And dairy farmers noticed that there was a decline in their sales. So Uncle Sam intervened and Uncle Sam started buying a more sustainable or like a, a dairy product with a longer shelf life which would be cheese. And the U.S., for a number of years, has had a massive cheese surplus, which sounds funny until you realize we're talking about like 1.19 billion pounds of cheese. It's crazy because our cheese consumption is more than doubled, but we still aren't putting a dent in that surplus. And you could say that the government was right to intervene and buy this cheese to help out these dairy farmers. It's still pretty rough, though, because like in 2016, farmers had to resort to just straight up pouring out almost 50 million gallons of unsold milk, like literally Depression era style, pouring it out into holes in the ground. And that's where... The National Dairy Promotion Board, a trade group, came in and created Dairy Management Incorporated. They're a marketing branch of the USDA, and they're funded through something that are called checkoff fees, not like the playwright, like check off this thing from a list. The, they're the they're the folks who gave us the Got Milk campaigns. You guys remember Got Milk? Like that? Oh my god, that did really well, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That and uh, what pork, the other white meat and beef oh, is yeah. what's for dinner. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good comparison. Yeah. They're, they're very similar in design. Uh, and they wait also- a second, Ben. When did when did stuffed crust become a thing? Uh, because we can match this up, I think. <laughs> like- you know what? Honestly, I feel like we. <sighs> We've done some really heavy, dark stuff for full episodes lately. Would you guys be interested in doing a full cheese conspiracy episode? Cheese conspiracy yes. all day. Oh my gosh, yes, Matt, you, you make a really good point. I mean, what a what a what better place to like inject a little extra cheese into a thing that's already like eighty <laughs> percent cheese? You know, uh, maybe that's a little high, but yeah, it's it's true and it's popular. The kids love it. 
Because it's like a novelty. It, it makes it, it's like a cheesy breadstick and a pizza in one. Um, oh. But Ben, wasn't there even an allegation or the notion that like Kraft macaroni and cheese powder was in some way repurposed uh, government cheese? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's what, uh, that's what Ryan's referring to. I think that's part, honestly, that's part of why I want us to make this a full episode because I, I feel like we can find the answer if we dig in. Uh, we know that Taco Bell and McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Domino's, they've all upped their cheese, uh, their cheese content, right? As a proportion of the, the stuff that you order. And that part of that is with help from Dairy Management Incorporated because this didn't come from nowhere. They didn't just, it, like Wendy's didn't just decide, let's make stuff extra cheesy. Agents, this is an actual conspiracy, agents of the Dairy Management Incorporated organization are in contact with Burger King. They have infiltrated Domino's. And I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of cheese, like a lot of people. Is it because I've been brainwashed? Is it because I actually like cheese? Uh, I, I don't care. I like to, I don't care. From my perspective, cheese is top notch. We, this is a second cheese related episode that we've, our cheese related story we've done where we had a uh, criminal um, who got caught on an encrypted uh, app um, by posing with a piece of cheese, a, a, a piece of blue cheese. And I believe I mentioned, and I don't know like exactly what the science is behind this, but there definitely is a study or a two that I've seen that conflates cheese the way it affects the pleasure. Uh, receptors in the brain to a similar way the drugs or, or specifically stimulants uh, like cocaine affects the brain. So th there is a such thing as a cheese addiction. At the very least, it is something that triggers uh, endorphins in the brain. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, before we go with this, so first, Ryan, this, this part of the show is going to be a little bit short because we don't want to reveal too much about the hidden hand that is slinging cheese secretly across the nation but we want you to know the conspiracy is real there is an actual thing and here's one example in 2012 uh dmi embedded a food scientist named lisa mcclintlock uh, into the taco bell product development team this is something ryan already knows we're just sharing it uh, with everybody else McClintlock worked with the senior manager for product development at Taco Bell, a guy named Steve Gomez, to develop a specific kind of cheese filling that would literal that would actually stretch like taffy the way it does on the commercials, figure out how to mass produce it, and then also invent some uh, proprietary machinery along the way. So they were creating a need for cheese on a commercial scale. And this creation, this thing they came up with, uh, you might recognize it if you go to a Taco Bell today, it's called the quesalupa. Each shell in a quesalupa contains an entire ounce of cheese. It's about five times the amount of cheese that you would see in, in your garden variety crunchy taco. So just to make the shells, Taco Bell had to buy 4.7 million pounds of cheese. Well done, Agent McClintlock. And I say that as a guy who's eaten a, a quesadilla, but they're pretty, they're pretty solid. They hold up. I did not like them. Uh, just putting that out there. I did not like them. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I recently tried Taco Bell's new naked chicken chalupa. Uh, I didn't even realize what it was. I just thought it was kind of interesting. They had naked in the title. I mean, they made it sound like <laughs> it was like a healthy item. When mm. I see naked chicken, I think undressed, kind of like less saucy chicken. That's maybe a little <laughs> better for you. But it turns out what it means is the chalupa shell is made of a piece of fried chicken. What? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So not healthy at all. Like a uh, double down. Like uh, just so <laughs> it is not what I was expecting at all. But um, Ben, we need to. I think we need to trace down these cheese pulls uh, to their source. Um, mm -hmm. Go down these cheesy rabbit holes and, 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 and see what what lurks beneath the uh, bubbling surface. It's true. Look for this episode coming up in the next few weeks. But the last thing I'll say before we move on to our third story today is uh, one time president of the DMI, President Barbara O'Brien, said. Here's a little secret to the pizza companies. If you use more cheese, you sell more pizza. Kind of similar to the way, I, I don't know, that statement reminds me of uh, the way members, veterans of the plastics industry said, 
recycling sells more plastic. And Matt, we can trace, we can correlate, we can do more than simply correlate stuffed crust. Uh, the story about stuffed crust is that the first person to claim to invent it is a Brazilian guy named Rubens Augusto Jr. He's the founder of a pizza chain called Petroni. He says he invented stuffed crust back in 1986. But the DNI, in 1995, the DMI, which was brand new on the scene, they worked specifically with Pizza Hut to create the stuffed crust pizza. And Stop. They, yeah, and they did because because their goal was, and they've they've provided these estimates. You can find them. They said if every U.S. pizza maker added one extra ounce of cheese per pie, the industry would sell an additional two hundred and fifty million pounds of cheese every year. This is happening. There is a conspiracy afoot, and it has been around for uh, more than a couple decades now to make you eat more cheese as a way of moving this massive cheddar surplus. Like, this is a real story. This is amazing. Now I'm thinking the freaking Ninja Turtles were created by dairy management to sell more pizza. Oh, maybe, my God. Maybe not Maybe not the original comic, but the, uh, the film <laughs> yes. adaptations for or The sure. kids' shows. Yeah, the, the kids' kid shows. shows. If you can get to the children, you know, like, <laughs> like old Dirty said, you know, Wu-Tang's for the kids because the kids get their parents to buy stuff. I do believe the children are our future. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, everybody agrees uh, that the battle of hearts and minds, uh, you make your most significant wins with children. From a cold marketing perspective, it does make sense because uh, any income that a child will have will tend to be 100% disposable income. Oh, and then it becomes all driven by nostalgia and driven by fond memories of childhood. And then you pass it on to your kids. It just, it's like a, it's an endless cycle that benefits big cheese, big cheese. That's right. Look. So Ryan, it turns out that we can not only say this conspiracy is true, but we can say, uh, there's more to, there's more to chew on here. So what we're going to do is, uh, pause uh, we'll check back in with you in probably a few weeks when we do a full episode on this. But for now, let's hold for a word from our sponsors uh, while Matt, Noel, Doc, and I uh, go get our queso dip, which is what we eat during the commercials. Look to the Missouri caves. And we're back with our final message from you, the public. The conspiracy realists of the world. This one comes from the sexy beast. It's a episode rife with uh, with amazing pseudonyms. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. Hey, all! I have a lot of interesting internet stalking stories, unfortunately, <laughs> but there's a particular one uh, that came to mind during a recent strange news show, as it likely came about from an app behaving poorly with data. A friend and I would sign off texts, calling each other off the wall pet names. One such time, I referred to my friend as Sexy Beast. I have never used the term Sexy Beast in my life. And while the term, okay, so I guess Sexy Beast technically is the friend's nickname, but I'm sticking with it because mm -hmm. this uh, listener did ask to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never used the term Sexy Beast in my life. And while the term Beast could have popped up to spark the idea for the name in some subliminal way, combining it with Sexy is just something that wasn't in my vernacular. And I had not recently observed those two words together. It cracked me up immediately. It would have stood out. Uh, I checked my spam folder within a couple of days of sending that text and a particular set of words caught my attention in the message preview. Hello, sexy beast. I was referred to as sexy beast through the entire email, courtesy of an autofill format. Uh, wherever the ad targets name should grammatically appear, there was sexy beast. I took a screenshot and found this real estate person, the advertiser on Facebook, and posted to their page asking about the email. I never received a reply. While the specific advertiser likely bought this information, someone pulled the information from my text, as there was never another correlation. Of course, they didn't observe I wasn't the sexy beast, but maybe I'm just their sexy beast. Uh, I may be able to find some screenshots, though I don't use some of those accounts or devices anymore. Uh, this was several years ago now, which also says to me this sort of stuff has all gotten much worse. Stuff being gross invasions of privacy. I prefer to remain anonymous. I probably have some other pretty out there on topic stories. I may relay in part another day. Thanks for an interesting show, Anonymous uh, or Sexy Beast. 
So, yeah, this is interesting. And this really fit, feeds into a lot of the kind of big picture paranoia of like, are our apps listening to us? You know, um, you talk about a thing that you have no recollection of ever Googling or writing in an email. I think email is pretty much known to be on the table uh, as far as your devices and things, you know, social media apps pulling from email, especially if you're using Gmail. I certainly have. Uh, we we do we deal with a lot of sponsors, for example, right? So the moment I get an email vetting a sponsor for us, I start getting ads for that sponsor all the time. I think we've all probably seen this happen. There's no question. There's some crosstalk going on. The second one that people that one I think is relatively conclusive. The second one is listening, right? Is Facebook listening to our conversations and then serving us with ads? Facebook says no. Um, there was a report that they, or a statement they issued back in 2016 that said they unequivocally are not listening to our conversations. The mic only is turned on for specific uses, um, when you grant it permission to do so. And it would not, you know, have crosstalk with other apps. What we're talking about today or what Sexy Beast is talking about is something different. I didn't get from this email whether, uh, Sexy Beast was using an Android device or an Apple device. But Apple devices um, uh, pretty unequivocally uh, encrypt both ends of, of iMessage interactions. So actually, I was looking on Reddit, and I found a post very similar to this where a, uh, an individual was talking about messaging with his sister about an Acer laptop that she bought like years ago, asking if they knew she knew where, where it still was. And then, boom, immediately starts getting served with ads for Acer laptops. Um, in, in the, in the, the chatter on the, uh, the post, uh, people point out that iMessage is encrypted, that not even Apple can see the content of those messages, that something must have been happening that is giving this advertiser, uh, these, this information, but it's not from iMessage. Somebody pointed out that it's possible that spotlight, which is a search feature within the phone, um, perhaps, was targeting a keyword in the message or, you know, sometimes if you have a message and then there's like an underlined term, you can hit it or you can search for it in spotlight and then it'll like give you web results that somehow that had happened. But um, the idea that it, that I message was being, you know, pulled from uh, covertly is, is pretty easily debunkable. I think. How much detail do we have about whether it was specifically I message? We don't. Okay. We don't at all. Because if it was Facebook Messenger, it could easily happen because I believe they only have, for example, Facebook or Snapchat or whatever, they only have in-transit encryption. And then also, I think maybe, if we're going to breadcrumb a little bit, uh, we had that earlier, we had the earlier piece from the privacy advocate who had kind of walked through uh, how this sort of data scraping occurs. Uh, that's, That's what it was. The conversation mm-hmm. from Strange News with uh, Robert Reeve, somebody. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And he, he lays out a really convincing case. Uh, his his conversation is still available on Twitter. What this is, ma- is making me think, if we Hansel and Gretel just a bit, I'm wondering, you sexy beast, uh, how many how many apps on your device at the time were granted access to various things, right? Like you might get, you might pull up an app depending on your device and have these weird requests. And you're thinking, well, why does this thing need to know my location to work? Why does it need to have access to my microphone or my camera, et cetera? And I think, you know, maybe all of us are, are kind of on the same page there. It, it can be tough to figure out where the leak occurs, right? Yeah, it can be. And also, what of all of this is just coincidence? You know, I mean, Sexy Beast is a movie. Um, Our listener did not mention that. It's a movie starring Ben Kingsley that's a pretty popular movie. I I, I have no reason to believe that uh, that has anything to do with anything. But uh, the the listener did kind of say, I'm not sure where this term came from, uh, felt as though they had kind of made it up on the spot or combined these words in a nonsensical fashion. But I think maybe even subconsciously, uh, the listener was aware of the movie Sexy Beast. Um, I think it is a British slang, perhaps, uh, referring to someone as being good looking you say oh you sexy beast you and um i think that's where it comes in in the movie it's a it's a british character and to be fair we cannot and have no way of confirming the beastliness or sexiness of this person we do not that is accurate 
beastliness and sexiness have ever been in the eye of the beholder. I say believe in yourself, folks. You know, be that beast <laughs> mode if you want to be. You're, you're as sexy as you feel. You know, you're a sexy you're, beast you want to see in the world. That's what I'm saying yeah. is we cannot determine what what, <laughs> what was whatever system or advertiser or company. What did they use to determine the beastliness and sexiness? What well, were uh, they gleaning from other information <laughs> the listener was putting out onto the Internet and into these uh, other channels that perhaps caused an algorithm to uh, <laughs> determine that this, in fact, was an appropriate nickname? And that's the coincidence there. Either way, I'm going to I'm going to say we we're getting back in the T-shirt game. We're going to make a T-shirt that out of context will make no sense to anybody. It'll just say stuff they'll want you to know. Uh, you're you're as sexy as you want to be. You're as sexy as you want a beast. OK, boom. And uh, I cannot uh, hang out today. I have I am become weird. <laughs> yeah, I'm sticking mm-hmm. with that becomes strange. I've been yes, doing I'm sorry, experiments excuse me, excuse with me, this yes, in the field. Me. No, I think you got to, you know, it's like sexiness. It's however you feel. Uh, I've been doing it in the field and um, people take you seriously or, or they're not going to call you on it when you say you've become strange. It just, it sounds like, but I think I am become weird uh, could also work. I'd love to hear your results for anybody who's tried this out in the wild. But this goes to something else, another detail that you mentioned, um, Noel and Sexy Beast, which is this clearly is an automated form, right? which means they were pulling that phrase and they were applying it imperfectly, right? So it could also, you know what it could be? It could be that um, our Sexy Beast has done nothing wrong whatsoever and that it was something on the other person's side. I have another theory, Ben. Um, My daughter, uh, you can actually tell Siri on your iPhone to call you something, and then emails will refer to you as that thing. So I still have an email account where my daughter changed my name in my phone to Princess, and so I occasionally get emails addressed to Princess. Um, I wonder if maybe... Some of these texts were happening via voice, uh, and it was saying Siri. Uh, call, who knows? Maybe Siri got her wires crossed and decided that this gentleman's name was Sexy Beast. Um, it, it is. It is a. It is a sort of a hidden under the hood feature that Siri will do. You can say, "Hey Siri, from now on, I want you to call me Sexy Beast." And then, in any interaction with uh, Siri, she will refer to you as Sexy Beast or Princess. In my case, hmm. So yeah. lots to unpack here, um, lots to keep an eye on uh, as, you know, and again, the, this is a, the, these these Reddit threads are quite old. Like I, I ran into one um, of, of a gentleman who uh, and his wife who decided they were going to talk about cat food um, for a day uh, and they don't have cats. They haven't had cats in 20 years, they said, and that was not something they would ever talk about. And then lo and behold, two or three days later, they started getting served up ads for cat food. Um, so again, Facebook says it doesn't do this. Facebook says it doesn't listen. Um, but, you know. That's what we're here for is to question these official lines that these companies put forth. Right. I don't know if I believe them or not. I've still got my super yacht experiment going on. And to be honest with everyone, I've had mixed to middling results. I think it's because not to be too much of a cartoonish stereotype of myself. I think it's because I have a lot of different proxies and ad blockers and things like that on And I want to have targeted ads for obscene billionaire stuff like dirigibles, of course. Uh, But I I'm just not ready to turn off all the stuff, all the bells and whistles. You know, I mean, ah, it's tough, though. It's tough because the point like unless you do not participate in online communication, someone has your stuff. Someone is going to like the we haven't done a story on this yet, but the FBI was confirmed recently to have made up their own like encrypted criminal app, like the one we talked about, similar to the encrypted app that got uh, infiltrated by law enforcement that we mentioned, I think, uh, earlier this week or the past week. The FBI actually just made one up. Obviously, the Navy was involved with the creation of the onion router technology the illusion of privacy is increasingly and very much uh, truly an illusion. It's true. Well, to, to be fair with that thing, they paid a dude who was going to go down. Like he was re- he was going to go down uh, legally really hard, but they got him and then paid him to make a whole encrypted app. And then they distributed it to, to everybody. 
And then massive amounts of criminals were just texting. And the FBI is like, oh, really? You're going to be at the dock at what time? Because it turns out even uh, organized crime uh, gets a case of FOMO every now and then. You know, Mm -hmm. you're talking to your capos and you're like, you're like, well, the other families got this cool app. Well, you guys, we got to live in the future. Well, it's That's, like that app we were talking about in the cheese story. Uh, not today's cheese story, the previous cheese story. That right. was created yeah. specifically, you know, and, and, and tied to a piece of hardware with all of these things turned off, you know, by design. Um, and, and speaking of that, Ben, you, you made a good point. If you do, just know your settings, know your device, and and uh, and do what you can, if you wish, to limit those location um, tracking, you know, settings. You can go into your devices, uh, specifically, you know, I think we all use iPhones, um, settings and then privacy and location services in uh, iOS. And then you can literally scroll down and turn it on or off for various applications that you have on your phone. There's even one that's called significant locations to see a log, uh, a record of where you've been. And then you can turn that off. You can clear that history. You can also limit ad tracking. There is a cap that you can put on ad tracking in iOS where you go to settings, privacy, advertising, and limit ad tracking. Turn that on. Um, and in Android, you can go to settings, Google ads, and opt out of ads personalization. So those are a few things you can do. Are they just kind of little little gimmies to make us feel better? Whistles I don't know. in the graveyard? Uh, uh-huh, a million percent. Possibly. It's, it's all recoverable. Mm-hmm. I know, Matt. I know. I'm just trying to give the good people a little bit of information to give them some peace of mind. Because it's not <laughs> like we're going to stop using our devices, you know? And the bad ones, too. Shout out Fair to enough. the bad people. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but that's it for me, y'all. It is a, a really interesting perspective uh, from the sexy beast. Uh, whether coincidence or whether something nefarious that we haven't even begun to fully wrap our heads around, it's definitely fascinating. Uh, and, and we thank you for that email as we thank uh, everyone that wrote in and called in today. Yes, yes. Uh, shout out to Sexy Beast. Shout out to Two Chains, the one and only Ryan. In my head, the three of you are in a band called Big Cheese Secrets. Uh, <laughs> up for workshopping, of course. It's, it's your creative endeavor. Uh, we support you. We're looking forward to the first single. If you want to take a page uh, from our fellow conspiracy realist books and be part of the show, we would love to hear from you. You are the most important part of this endeavor. We try to be easy to find online. That's right. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, where we are conspiracy stuff. On Instagram, we are conspiracy stuff show. On YouTube, conspiracy stuff again. Switched it up on you. Oh, you didn't realize we were going to do that. Ben is making that scary Sorry. clown face that he does sometimes. It Sorry. really I just have to remember to blink <laughs> when we're on these calls because we're recording for video. And so I have to, you know, uh, it's a whole thing. But I got the I got the frequency down. That was that was the big killer. Uh do please check out uh Can I Start a Cult on our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about um what the yellow eyed man was doing uh and, and to I, two chains. I would say you can do whatever you set your mind to, and we hope that you do, I, I guess. Maybe don't start. Uh, whatever. It, it's up to you. Uh, but let us know what your cult is. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll check it out. Uh, and you can also give us a telephone call to do that if you have any good cult stories. We are one eight three three stdwytk Go ahead and leave us a message. Try to limit it to one message, please. Three minutes is the time that you shall have. That time is yours to do with what you wish. If you think you need more time than that and you want to write us a little bit of a missive, you can do so via a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.